Psalm 110 of David, a psalm. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Johnny, for reading. Let me add my welcome. It's great to see you here on Sunday morning. Um, What a great psalm. Uh, What a joy it's been to to see how the psalms... um, point towards Easter over the last few weeks um, as well. Um, There's lots going on here, just in seven verses, but um, lots of things happening. So why don't we pray for the Lord's help as we uh, come to this passage. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. He came, he lived who suffered, who died, who rose, and who is now ascended at your right hand now. Lord, we praise you that as we gather, the Lord Jesus is watching over us and ministering to us as we gather together. We pray that by his spirit, we would hear his voice, we would be coming before him with humility of heart, allowing him to do his work. We pray that as we come to this psalm now, we would see more of his greatness, of his goodness and majesty, and long uh, to bow before him in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We've just um, sung a couple of uh, songs, haven't we, with with kind of questions in them. Um, uh, Kind of, uh, what if my world should fall? Or uh, um, the Ancient of Days one that we just sang about, kind of, how, what will I, I do um, when um, kind of all around me feels, I don't know what the future brings, the nations are raging, kingdoms rising and, and falling. And I guess there's a bit of a question behind those songs. We all kind of feel that instinctively, don't we? Those questions come from time to time. And I guess the question is, how will Jesus win? <laughs> How will the Lord prevail when we see all of these things going on around us and in our own hearts? And maybe you hear that question, and we don't really doubt that he's going to be victorious in the end. We trust what he said, but the pathway there feels awfully foggy, awfully foggy. I can't really see. I know it's going to happen, but I don't really know how. But there are times, aren't there, when that fog is less fog and more of a a giant brick wall. And the obstacles do seem quite overwhelming. I wonder what it might be that causes you the most concern, the thing that you find in your prayers, perhaps. What might it take to, to make you find it hard to believe that the Lord can prevail over this? Maybe some of the things Johnny was praying about a culture that we see that, that calls good evil and evil good. Trying to unmoor itself from Christian roots like a runaway train and all the damage that we see as a result of that. Maybe overwhelming sadness of, of sin and evil in the world. Times when we find it hard to believe that anyone is in charge. We see them on our screens, but each of us will know them in our lives as well, I'm sure. How will the Lord prevail? How is Jesus going to win? And it's not a new question for God's people. It's one that we come up against again and again, and we see it in the Psalms plenty of times. And this Psalm 110 is one of the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament. 
Jesus quotes it. Peter quotes it. It's in Hebrews. It's, it's all over the place. So clearly this psalm has got something to say about what Jesus is coming to do. But before we get to the New Testament, it forms a little trio of psalms here in the book, from 108 to 110. And like any good trilogy, if you've read or seen one, that the middle one is the one that kind of takes you through turmoil. Uh, Psalm 109, we haven't read it. Go and have a look at it later. But God's king is in dire straits, betrayed, left in danger. He's probably asking, how will God get me out of this? There is a plea for vindication at the end of the psalm. And if Psalm 109 is a bit like the Empire Strikes Back or the Two Towers, then we get to Psalm 110, and it's more like the return of the Jedi or the return of the king. They've both got a savior figure, a king figure, and so does Psalm 110. And this savior is the key to answering our question, how will the Lord prevail? Well, three answers. So let's dive in. Firstly, he shows us that Jesus is God's ascended king who reigns through his people. Jesus is God's ascended king who reigns through his people. Do you spot there, just in the little superscription on your psalm, it says, of David. That, that's part of the text. That's not an addition that came afterwards. And that's important because it helps us work out who verse 1 is talking about. This psalm, it, there's kind of two bits of speech from God to someone who is called David's Lord. The one in verse 1, do you see? And then another one down in verse 4, two bits of speech. And David is like a fly on the wall. The Lord has helped him to hear, overhear these bits of speech, and the rest of the psalm is commenting on those bits. So let's have a look at the first one. Verse 1, the Lord, that's God, Yahweh, the God who delivered his people out of Egypt, who has made covenant promises and blessings to his people. God said to my Lord. So who is this Lord? Well, if this is a psalm of David, then it can't be David because he's the one speaking. And this word, my Lord, it, it's the word for someone superior to you, a bit like my, my master, my, my majesty. Superior to David, we think? The king of Israel? It's, as we read that, it's supposed to jar a bit. It's a bit like maybe uh, if we heard King Charles talking to, to his grand, one of his grandsons and calling them your highness. It would be a bit strange, wouldn't it? It would kind of stand out. This feels the wrong way round. You're, you're lower, you're beneath me. And yet here, David calls this person my Lord. It can only be the promised Messiah who is going to be of David's line. We see that in 2 Samuel 7. David's son that we're waiting for. We see here David's son is also David's Lord. That's who he is. And it makes sense because do you see where he is? Where is he? Sit at my right hand. Being at the right hand of God is the idea of sharing in the royal position, the place of greatest honor and power. Where was David's throne? It was Jerusalem, reigning over Israel. Where is this Lord's throne? Not just over Israel, but at the right hand of God himself. He rules from heaven over the entire cosmos. What we're getting here in the psalm is, is a little bit of an outline drawn. I wonder if you've ever um, kind of played that game, maybe with, with children, you kind of draw an outline of something and they have to kind of work out what it is and you gradually fill in details and you see kind of how quickly they can guess it before you fill things in. We're getting an outline here and gradually the image is becoming clearer. As we go through the Old Testament, we get this picture of a Messiah, an outline drawn by the Lord himself. This is God's ascended king who is reigning, David's son and David's Lord. But who is he? Well, when we get to the New Testament, we see, don't we? This king is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us himself in, in Mark 12 and Matthew 22, he, he quotes this part of the psalm. Then Peter, in his sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 
He says it as well. Paul tells us in Philippians, who is the one who is at the right hand of God? Who is at the highest place? Philippians 2 verse 9. Therefore God exalted him, the Lord Jesus, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We have an ascended King, Jesus. And here he has utterly prevailed, hasn't he? This Jesus who was mocked, scorned and rejected then was then raised from the dead, ascended to the right hand and is still there now, reigning over us. Jesus is David's son. He's in the line of David. But he's also David's Lord. He is David's Messiah. But what is this reign going to look like? Have have a look down. This reign is one, it is opposed, but it's also unstoppable. Do you see? Uh, There is a kind of time frame to it. Sit at my right hand until, verse 1, I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. There is only one way in which this reign is going to end. And this kind of whole footstool thing, don't think kind of a footstool in your lounge sofa. This is more the idea of being crushed underfoot. It's that that promise back in Genesis 3 that someone would crush the serpent, crush Satan. Or in Joshua chapter 10, you can read of the kings who are crushed by Joshua as a picture of the judgment that God will bring and his final victory. This is a reign which is opposed for a time, but ultimately one against which all opposition is foolish. And we'll see more of that at the end of the psalm. But we sing that song, don't we? Remember the kids' song? God sits in the highest place, full of glory, full of grace. It don't matter what the proud ones say, because God sits in the highest place. That is the sense here. It don't matter what the proud ones say. Nothing can stop the reign of this ascended king. So Jesus is God's ascended king who reigns. But as we have a look at verses 2 and 3, we see this reign is going to extend. And how? It's through his people. And that might be odd, because you might think, Jesus, don't you need to kind of be there to extend your kingdom. That's kind of normally the way things happen, isn't it? How can you do it from afar? He does it through his people. Verse 2, God's mighty scepter, the sign of his rule, extends from where? From Zion. That is the place where the temple was built, where God and man dwelt together. We might say now that is God's people, that the church, that is where his rule is going to go out over the world from. And it will face opposition. Verse 2 is to rule in the midst of his enemies. But how how do you do that? How do you rule in the midst of enemies? It's it's not just a kind of someone facing kind of backbenchers, is it? I think the sense is you turn enemies into friends. We see rebels changing sides, drawn in loyalty towards this king. Have a look at verse 3. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle. Willing, this is idea in the Old Testament, we see the idea of a free will offering. It's not an offering that you have to make to be right with God. It's an offering that you want to make because you're so grateful for all he has done. No one is forcing them to join in the extending of God's kingdom. No, they can't wait to join in. I wonder... You maybe studied World War I at, at, at school and you read stories, don't you, of the kind of, uh, the kind of call to service and people going and signing up. And particularly of people who were so eager to sign up that they would lie about their age. You know, some of them were, were terribly young, maybe 14, maybe, maybe younger. And why did they do that? Because they wanted to serve and protect their country. 
And there's a sense of that here. God's people here, his willing troops, they see the privilege of advancing God's kingdom and they cannot wait to join in. But this isn't so much a kind of physical battle or kingdom as a spiritual one. When we think about the Lord Jesus extending his kingdom over the earth from heaven, extending his reign through his people, what does that look like? Well, when he ascended in Acts chapter 1, we see he invites people to go and be his witnesses all over the earth, and he gives them his spirit to do that. That is how his reign extends today. As people witness to Jesus' death, life, resurrection, his reign, his return. As each of us, individually and together, makes the truth of the gospel known in our lives, in our words, in our workplaces, in our homes. A book uh, on the ascension I was reading this week by Tim Chester and Johnny Woodrow puts it this way. We see the reign of Christ wherever his word is proclaimed and trusted. If your friend responds with faith to an evangelistic course, then Christ's reign has been extended. If you talk about how you are a Christian or how you became a Christian at work, then Christ's reign is being announced in that place. If someone is baptized, then Christ's reign has taken a visible form in their lives. You can share the Lord's Supper earlier. That is another sign of that, isn't it? Or if you make a choice to obey Christ's command in the face of temptation, you hold on to his promises when life is tough, Christ's reign is made present in history. Do you know what that means? That means that Christ's reign is extending at and through Redeemer Winchester. Isn't that wonderful? Doesn't that make you excited? And not just at Redeemer Winchester, but all of God's people who are gathering together around the world. God's ascended king is extending his kingdom through his people. What a privilege. Now, it's not easy. We're in the midst of enemies, and we often long and hope for more, don't we? And that is coming. But now, it is the day of battle. Do you see verse 3? It's a day of battle. Verse 5 to 7, there is a day of wrath, but we are in a time where Jesus is winning and extending his kingdom. Martin Luther, the famous reformer, wrote, we Christians, I think it'll be on the screen, are not able to subdue the devil and the world by means of powerful weapons. Rather, we are to fight for Christ by suffering, by faith, and by the preaching of God's word. He's right, isn't he? So how does that help us with our question? How is Jesus going to win? How is God going to prevail? Well, one way is that God's ascended king reigns through his people. And so this psalm calls us, doesn't it, each of us to look, lift up our eyes to the one who is on the throne above every other power, to know that he is seated there. He is growing his kingdom and is welcoming us to be a part of what he is doing. So the question is, will we join in? Can we give ourselves willingly like these troops? Will we pray for that in our own hearts and for our church family? Jesus is God's ascended king who reigns through his people. But I wonder, there's a question, isn't there? Verse 3, where do these troops, these willing followers come from? And I think the answer is that, as we've already said, the enemies are being turned into troops. But how is that possible? Because if Jesus is merely God's ascended king who rules, who reigns, and comes back to judge, then, then how do we deal with our problem of sin? Well, that's what verse 4 helps us with. You see, this king doesn't simply come and reign and go straight to glory. He goes there via the cross. This king came to give his life as a ransom for many. It's possible because he's not just a king, but he is also a priest. That's our second point. Jesus is God's ascended priest who mediates for his people. 
Have a look at verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You, that's talking to the same person in verse 1, my Lord, David's son, David's Lord, the Lord Jesus, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, most of this psalm is about the Messiah as a king, but the psalmist doesn't want us to miss how vital it is that he is also a priest. In fact, the whole hope of this psalm hinges on this verse. So he emphasizes it. God doesn't just say these words. We see verse 4, he swears them. They are an oath, and God never goes back on them. Well, what is so important? Firstly, it is that this king is also a priest. You are a priest. Well, why is it so important that Jesus is a priest? Most churches like ours would typically really not use the word priest that much. Johnny and I tend not to put our names up as priest on, on the website or say, oh, welcome, I'm, uh, I'm the assistant priest this morning. Normally, that's something which we think kind of conjures up Catholicism or history. But here we're told that we need a priest. And David is right. A priest here is a mediator between God and man. Sometimes you get legal disputes between uh, parties or perhaps families or businesses where things get so messy and so full of animosity that you need to bring in someone from outside to mediate these two parties. Someone who can stand in the middle and help with communication and kind of try and bring about some sorts of reconciliation, some agreement or settlement. Sometimes these two parties or people, they can't even stand being in the same room as each other. Or it's as if they're there, but they keep speaking past each other. But if two humans or two companies sometimes need a mediator for small human problems, how much more do we need a mediator between us and the holy God? We who, by nature, we fall into verse 2, don't we? We are the enemies. By nature, we are rebellious against God. What hope have we got of entering the presence of the king, the one who is holy? What hope have we got of knowing his favor and forgiveness? Well, we need a mediator. We need a priest. Now, in the Old Testament, this mediation was kind of brought about through the sacrificial system. So you would have a priest who firstly makes a sacrifice for sin. That's the, the animal. The blood is shed to pay the price of punishment. And then the priest would go into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies, and plead with the Lord on behalf of the people, saying, this sacrifice has been made. Their sins have been paid for. And when this happens, there's a kind of order to it. And it's a kind of upward order as well. See, the priest makes the sacrifice in the courtyard and then goes through somewhere called the holy place, which has got lots of incense in it. And then they go into the most holy place, which has got the ark, which is like God's throne. And as they go in, they're wearing a breastplate, which has got 12 jewels, which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. It's as if the priest is bringing the people into the presence of God to intercede on their behalf. He remembers them before the Lord and asks the Lord to accept atonement. And we read again and again when this is done, this is pleasing to the Lord. The priest has mediated the relationship between God and his people. He's made atonement and prayed on their behalf. Those who are far off, those who are rebels and enemies, they're brought near. But there are problems. Problem with the offerings. We read that the blood of bulls and lambs, they couldn't make atonement for human sin. Problem with the offerers, the priests, well, they weren't perfect either. The mediators needed a mediator. They had to atone for their own sin first, and at some point they had to retire. And these problems were kind of built in because this whole mediation program was only ever meant to be a picture, a bit like a picture book that children might look at and learn about something, and then one day they see the real thing. 
This is meant to be a picture of the heavenly reality. And so we see David's Lord, the Lord Jesus, in this psalm, you are a priest, but, but not any type of priest. Do you see a priest forever, one who will not die, in the order of Melchizedek? And we've seen the problem with the priesthoods before. They were all in the line of, of Aaron. But Melchizedek gives us another model. He's not a character we uh, come across that often in the Bible. If you want to read more, have a look at Genesis 14. Uh, this psalm and Hebrews 5 to 7. He's a, a, a king who is also a priest. Abraham meets him, gives him a tithe, and Melchizedek blesses him. But the, the key thing is, he is a priest as well as a king. And he's someone in a book like Genesis, which is full of genealogies of showing beginnings and endings. He's someone that has no beginning or end. We know nothing about him. He comes and he goes. It's like he's there forever. The psalmist is telling us this is the kind of priest we need, a priest who is forever, who is more like Melchizedek. Jesus is this kind of priest. Just listen to what difference this makes. So like the priests before who made a sacrifice on earth, Jesus makes his sacrifice. But unlike them, that sacrifice is not an animal. No, he himself dies on the cross for the sins of his people. Hebrews 10 says this, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, that's the Lord Jesus, when he offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. Remember the psalm? For by one sacrifice, He's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We have a better offering. But like the priests of Aaron, he then goes through the holy place, remember, which has the incense, a bit like clouds. Jesus goes through the clouds when he ascends. Because the priest's role is not simply to make the sacrifice, but to bring it and to bring the people into the presence of God. So as Jesus ascends and goes through the clouds of heaven, he enters not the picture book, but the true heavenly tabernacle, the presence of God himself. He intercedes and remembers us before the Father. But unlike those other priests, his offering is of eternal value. There is nothing more that needs to be paid. And we can be eternally sure of our atonement, of our forgiveness. Why? Because he does it forever. Forever. Jesus is now interceding for each one of us at the right hand of God. And we can be sure that we are right with him because Christ is there on our behalf. Hebrews 7 verse 24 because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. We sing that hymn, don't we? We're going to sing it later. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for me. What a precious truth. What wonderful assurance that Jesus is our mediator, that as our priest, he's done everything that is needed. And with Jesus as your priest, you can never be more securely in the presence of God than you are already now. But how does Jesus win? How does he prevail? How does this help? Well, because he's not just a king, but a priest king. And he extends his kingdom through his priestly work. That's the way the enemies become friends. As a priest, he can bring us back to God. And as king, he enlists us in his service for his glory. The enemies of verse 2, if you like, become the willing troops of verse 3. Because the king of verse 1 is also the priest of verse 4. How will Jesus win? 
Well, because he's God's ascended king who reigns through his people, and he's God's ascended priest who mediates for his people. The offer is there for rebellious enemies to become loyal troops and followers. But the psalm is clear that there is a countdown timer on. Verse 1 to 4 are described as a day of battle in verse 3. But verse 5 to 7 describes a day of wrath. That's our final point. Jesus is God's coming judge whose verdict is final. As we read these verses, it's a terrifying description, isn't it, of what will happen when the king returns. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head. We see the Lord and the Messiah working together here. The Lord is at your right hand to achieve justice. This crushing, it is the ultimate end of all evil, the ultimate dealing with all sin. And where does it lead to? Well, death. The wages of sin are death. Yet, as he brings judgment, he is sustained in his work by the Lord. We see at the end, he will finish triumphantly. Not in a kind of gleeful way, but his head is lifted up. There's a kind of vindication, a rightness to what's been done. However dreadful it might sound. And I think that helps us with two responses to this future day. Firstly, there is a comfort in God's justice. It is coming, whether we experience it in this lifetime or not. The Lord who sees every evil deed will judge fairly. He will bring the right verdict. Rebellion will not last forever. And it's going to be full and final. Do we see verse 7, verse 6, sorry, over the whole earth? And there is a certain comfort to be found there, isn't there? We all feel injustice in small ways and big ways. We all long for wrongs to be righted. I wonder what it might be for you. At the end of Psalm 109, God's people are crying out for vindication. It might be Christians in North Korea. It might be victims of human trafficking. Casualties of an ongoing war in Ukraine. We, the list could go on. There is a sense here that it is comforting to know those things will be brought to an end. In a world where evil seems to triumph, we're told that they will not triumph forever. Jesus will triumph in judgment, in justice. He is a coming judge whose verdict will be final. If you blow up a balloon and you kind of put a pencil on it and push in and in, what's going to happen eventually? Bang. There's an inevitability about it, isn't there? And I think there is something similarly shocking about these verses. It is going to happen. But he has not come yet. And so that's why, as well as a comfort that justice will happen, there is also a warning, isn't there? Jesus will triumph in judgment. That is clear. He's the ascended king. We sang, none above him, none before him, all of time in his hand. And for his enemies, that is a terrible thing. The question is, where do we stand? Are we in those verse 2 people, those rebels? Or are we in those joyful troops who seek to serve him? He will triumph in ju judgment either way over his enemies. But if we turn and trust in him as king and priest, then he can also triumph in mercy. This psalm tells us there is an awful day coming. And yet, there is a way to avoid judgment, to trust in him as priest and king. To accept that his judgment on the cross was in our place, that, that he is the one who is crushed. 
that his body would take ours on the heap. Christ will triumph in all of our lives. But will it be a triumph of judgment or a triumph of mercy? That is the warning. Well, how will the Lord prevail? Wonderfully, through his Messiah, through the Lord Jesus, who is God's ascended king, who reigns through his people, God's ascended priest, who mediates for his people, and God's coming judge, whose justice and verdict will be final. Let's take a moment to reflect, and then I'll lead us in a prayer. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Heavenly Father, we praise you for this verse, the way it spans so much of history and gives us hope for those times when we find it hard to believe that you will prevail, that you will win. Father, we thank you that Jesus is seated in the highest place. We thank you that nothing can move him from there. We thank you that he is extending his kingdom and we praise you for the privilege of being involved in your wonderful purposes. Father, we praise you that we, who by nature are your enemies, can be brought into your family, into your service, because Jesus is not just a king, but a priest who offered himself and intercedes for us eternally at your right hand. And Father, help us to live in light of that day when he comes to judge. We pray that every moment we are pained at the injustice in this world, we would find comfort in the return of Christ. We pray too, Father, that you would protect us from complacency. In our own lives, would we heed the warning? And in our conversations and friendships with others, would we make known the precious news that we can see mercy triumph in our lives instead of judgment because of what Christ has done? We pray all this in his precious name. Amen.